Today our scripture is from Luke 24, verse 13 to 32, if you're reading along. It's another Easter passage, which today the Greek Orthodox Church apparently is having Easter, so it's appropriate. Um, Will you read with me? Now that same day on Easter, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. Which I think is kind of ironic, telling Jesus he's dead. <laughs> um, that was it. Sentenced and crucified him. But we hope that he would be the one who would redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued as if he was going to go further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening, the day is over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? God, we pray for the word as it's preached this morning. Um, May the words of my mouth, the thoughts that come from my heart, be pleasing to you. I pray you speak with me, in me, through me, and in spite of me. And if there's any kernel of truth to what I say, may it rest in our hearts. We pray and ask this in your name. Amen. So, this passage has always bugged me. And partly because, mostly because, why didn't they recognize Jesus? I mean, they were his disciples. They said in the scriptures, that these are both of his disciples. So, they should know what he looks like. Presumably, they've spent some time talking with him. Like, was he wearing some sort of disguise? Did he have a mustache? Did he, have a, did he dye his hair different? Or did he do that Superman thing where, look, I'm wearing glasses, but no, I'm the Messiah. (laughs) You know? (laughs) So, it's always bugged me. And as I was studying the scriptures this week, I think, I realized the reason why they didn't recognize Jesus for who he is was because they weren't looking for him. They weren't looking for him to show up. You hear in the scriptures, he was so focused on talking about theology and what had happened in the last few days. And I'm not sure they believed any of it could be true. The thing that convinced me was, you know, they had heard that the women had, Mary and both the Marys had gone to the tomb and seen that it was empty. And the disciples had come and seen the tomb was empty. And it's the third day, so you would think they would make some correlation somewhere. They would think that he was alive. But instead of running to Jerusalem, as anybody would think, you would think that if you heard that Jesus might be alive, you'd think you'd turn around and run back to see what was going on. They were going six miles in the opposite direction to Emmaus. I think it's because the idea of Jesus coming alive again was completely outside the category of thinking. Dead people don't rise, so no matter how many times Jesus had said it, No matter matter how many times he had explained to them through the scriptures, they probably just didn't believe it. Dead people don't rise. 
Jesus can't break that category. And I think we as people, we put, we put so many things into separate categories and we can't think outside of them. I think of myself, um, I was at, when I was in Pasadena studying at Fuller, um, I was taking a summer cross in Greek, which wasn't as fun as a pamphlet made it seem. Uh, um, and yeah, so at about 10.30 every day, just to escape the, my brain being pounded, I went down to the cafeteria and there was Carlos. Um, he served food there and um, we, we started to develop a rapport, so much so that you know, all I had to do was walk into the cafeteria and eat no. Chorizo burrito, breakfast burrito. Yes, <laughs> perfect. You know, we knew each other and we had this friendly relationship and we would talk over the counter as he was preparing the food and all that stuff. But then I remember there was this one time I was walking on Colorado Boulevard, which is literally two streets away from Fuller. And I can't even remember what I was doing, but I saw Carlos there walking in the opposite direction. And we both kind of stared at each other for a while and looked and like, I know you from somewhere, but I'm not, sh not sure where. And at the very last second, we made the connection like, Fuller, Fuller, okay, cool. Whew. Two streets away, I didn't recognize him. And I, I thought maybe it was just me. I just had this bad face recognition thing. But um, I was reading um, an experiment that was done. And if you've heard about it, forgive me, indulge me. Um, but a couple of years ago, it was reported in the Washington Post that they tried this experiment where they wanted to put a famous violinist in the middle of the subway in the middle of a subway station and see whether people would recognize it. Um, and they didn't just choose any violinist. They chose Joshua Bell, which if you know anything about classical music, you know that he's this prodigy who is one of the premier violinists in the country, um, probably even in the world. So they put it, made him play that. And they didn't just give him any instrument. They gave him a 1713 Stradivari, which again, if you know your music, anything about classical music, it doesn't get much better than that. They said his violin, the violin that he played was worth $3.5 million. And then they gave him, said, and you play six classical pieces. And one of them was uh, Chaconne by Bach, which even Joshua Bell says that's one of the most complex pieces of music that you could ever play. Three days earlier, he had gone to Boston, the Boston Symphony Hall, filled it. The merely good seats, which means the ones be, not behind a pillar, were 100 bucks, and he sold, sold it up. But on that day, in the subway station, 1,097 people walked past him playing, and 27 stopped long enough to drop some change. He made $32 and some change in that one hour. He didn't have enough money from that one hour to buy a ticket to his own concert. People weren't expecting it. People weren't expecting to hear great music. They were so wrapped up in getting to the places where they had to go, doing the things that they had to do, that they would just walk on by. One thing that they said was consistent throughout, because the 27 people who stopped were all random, they couldn't figure out any data. But one thing they did see was that every child who walked past, they stopped and they wanted to listen. But every child was dragged away by their parents <laughs> to the next spot. Which made me think about, you know, when Jesus says, if you want to come to me, you have to receive me as a child. The really funny thing is, I think like, if you put all 1,097 of those people in a concert hall and had Joshua Bell do what he did, that would be rapturous applause, standing ovations, calls for encores, but take him outside of that and no one recognized him. And I think the church is no different. In the church, we're no different. We put Jesus into our very safe category. You know, Jesus is supposed to show up on Sunday morning. He's supposed to show up in our personal devotions. 
when we meet with the pastor sometimes, in small groups, in Christian bookstores, in Christian concerts. He shows up with us when we do missions trips and when we go do Christian acts. So he's nicely in our category of religion. And I'm no different. I remember there was this trip that I took to Boston um, in college. So I was full of college gusto and it was a short term missions trip. We were going to go to an inner slum in Boston, which was a really rough neighborhood. And naturally in these situations, you get really pumped up about going there and you think, yeah, I'm going to change the world. Boston will never be the same after we leave kind of thing because Jesus is going to be with us and everything we touch will turn to gold because Jesus is doing it with us. And then we got there. And a week later, our backs were hurting. We had spent, you know, we had paint in all sorts of places that we couldn't get out. We stank because we were only allowed to shower three times. Um, and it, we, you know, we had spent time caulking walls, fixing roofs, giving food out. But everything seemed so insignificant and little that I was being discouraged. It felt like you know, we were plugging in holes in a bucket that was never supposed to hold water. It felt like we were putting band-aids over huge gashes. Or how I felt was that you know, we were putting up little pebbles on the shore hoping to stop the tsunami that was going to come down. So I was discouraged. I was frustrated. I was like, but Jesus is supposed to be working through me, and why is nothing happening? And with that, I, we went into our final night when we went out to Park Street Station. Um, and it's a cold, bitter night. It was in April, but it had snowed the weekend before, and there was still snow on the ground. Great spring break. <laughs> <laughs> So it was cold, and we were going to work with this uh, missions group that went out every night, every Thursday evening to minister to the homeless out there. Um, they would have a little service, they would have some food, they would have, and they would try and give out clothes. And I was assigned to be one of those to help give out clothes. And I'm sitting in the back of this van, and I see this huge line start forming, and it was another frantic night of me climbing over the back of seats trying to find clothes that could fit them and give them out. And I saw coming up towards me was this really heavy set man. Like I, uh, I looked at him and I was like, I started evaluating people by sizes and I was like, triple X cell, okay? <laughs> you know? Um, and I kid you not, his jeans were tattered, tattered and he had, and his shoe, really, I kid you not, his feet were sticking out of his shoe and it was this cold, bitter night. So I was like, okay, I'm getting into action. I'm gonna try and find some stuff for him. I went to the t-shirts. Biggest thing I could find was a double XL. Brought it to him. It doesn't work. Okay. Run back. Go get the pants. Biggest thing I could find, 46 inch waist. Nope, that doesn't work either. I managed to find one sweater, but it wasn't really much thicker than the one he had already, but I gave it to him anyway. Managed to find a hat. Woo! I'm really helping him here. <laughs> and I managed to find a pair of socks so that he could at least, I couldn't find shoes obviously, but a pair of socks so at least he could put it over and it could be a little bit warmer than he was. I couldn't even find underwear. So I was feeling particularly useless at the time. And I just started getting so angry with myself, like look at you, you're doing nothing. You're not helping him at all. You're... And I was really secretly hoping that this guy would feel the same way and start shouting and spewing curses at me so at least I could feel that I'm I'm validated. But then this guy stops. And he says to me, thank you for what you're doing. God bless you because you're doing a great thing. And no sarcasm in his voice. I had spent all my time in this Boston trip expecting God to work through me that I almost missed Jesus standing in the form of this man showing me what it meant to have grace. It cut me right to my core. Now you think I would have learned from that, but no. About three weeks ago, again, I, had, I realized I had put Jesus back into my safe categories again because I was taking my dog for a walk, as I am one to do, and I saw down the street coming towards me where these two young men dressed really sharply 
and I thought, Mormons. <laughs> so I was trying to figure out a way, you know, to make them not see me and like get away as fast as I can. Unfortunately, we had already been walking 30 minutes, but that's when my dog decides he needs to pee. Thanks a lot. <laughs> so they came over and we were gonna have this conversation. And it turned out to be an actually good conversation. I can safely say I'm not a Mormon, but you know, we, we started talking about God and what we thought about him and faith and Jesus Christ and who we thought we were. And don't get me wrong, we had our disagreements, but it was a nice, friendly conversation. Um, and then they found out that I was working in the church and they thought that was cool and they left me a card and we went our separate ways. I thought, no, that wasn't so bad. And then as I was walking away, again, Jesus stops and smacks me in the head and says, do you see these two people? The amount of passion they have for their faith? They're out here in the, out of their comfort zone and they're going out and they're probably getting rejected nine times out of ten. You see, but they're still passionate about their faith. What would it look like if you had even an ounce of that passion? What would it look like if you lived even an ounce of the way they're living out their faith. Again, I had domesticized Jesus because, again, he, he was in my safe category. I, I, I meet him in church, but I don't meet him in the world. I expected Jesus to show up in the places that he has shown up before. And the history of the church is about expecting Jesus to show up in places he's shown up before. If you go to Europe, you see these mighty, tall cathedrals which are beautiful and cost a fortune to make and take generations to build. And you walk into them and you automatically feel like you're in the presence of God because everything's so majestic and glorious and beautiful, except most of them are empty. Um, I was talking to my professor yesterday about, um, he went on this tour of cathedrals and what he was most shocked about was that the tour guide would go up to the cathedral and they would walk in as the service was going on because there were only 10 people in this congregation and people are snapping photos and it's all great and no one even notices any difference. And at least they still have some congregants. We know that there are tons of these cathedrals also that have been turned into bars, turned into mosques, turned into art galleries. They're not even used for the purpose of the church anymore. And I think it's a testament of what happens when we stop looking for Christ in the world and expect Christ to show up in our arenas. And that's still a temptation that we have here in Seattle. I mean, statistics tell us we're one of the most unchurched regions in the world. And it's our every temptation to hunker down in our churches, never venture before our, beyond our four walls, find a nice, safe faith that we can practice. And it's our temptation as the harbor as well. I mean, we could exist. We've reached a point where we can exist um, very nicely without having to push to find our neighbors, to meet our neighbors, to meet our, the people of Seattle, to step out in faith to where God is calling us to go. But we've gone through the Gospel of Luke these last few months, and I'm quite ready to move on. And I've read, I've read Luke more times than I can remember in the last three months. And what was struck me the most was that Jesus only shows up in church in the Gospel of Luke three times. He shows up first when he's a kid, so his parents dragged him there. The next time he shows up, he goes to the synagogue and says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor, to bring freedom to the captives. And he spends the rest of his ministry out in the world. The time he comes back is when he goes to the temple and says, you've turned my house into, the house of the Lord into a den of thieves. But where does Jesus show up? He shows up by the Sea of Galilee to some fishermen, mending the nets and asks whether they would want their lives changed. He shows up in the wilderness and breaks bread and feeds 5,000 people there. He shows up at the home of the centurion. 
and he brings life to his daughter when life was not found. He shows up at the table of tax collectors and sinners and shows a love that transcends all boundaries. He shows up at the outskirts of town, finds ten lepers and heals them. Underneath a sycamore tree, calling Zacchaeus to believe in him and find his life changed. And he's found by the two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus. He shows up not in church, but in the world, and he continues to do it today. I sincerely believe Jesus is working in Seattle in ways and means beyond our understanding, beyond anything that the church is doing. All he is asking for us to do is to go out there, find him, and meet him. Meet him where he already is. Meet him where he's already working in guises we don't recognize. What would it look like if we walked out of this church expecting that Jesus is there? We just have to find him. If we walked into our workplaces, whether they're open to the gospel or openly hostile to them, understanding that no matter the circumstance, Jesus is there. We just have to look for him. What would it look like if we stepped into our neighborhoods, our friends, our family, into this Crown Hill neighborhood that God has placed us in, expecting that Jesus is waiting for us to meet him. In Jeremiah 29, verse 13, it says, You will seek me, and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. It reminds me of a story in the Chronicles of Narnia, um, Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Um, Lucy finds this book of spells. And among the spells that she finds is a spell to make hidden things visible. And so she utters it. And is surprised when she hears a soft pause behind her and turns around and sees Aslan, High King of Narnia, standing right there beside her. And she's happy and says, it's so good for you to be here. It's so good that you appeared. And Aslan says, I've always been here. You've just made me visible. That's all you've done. And Lucy doesn't believe it. And she says, as if anything I say can make you visible. And Aslan replies, do you think I wouldn't play by my own rules? God has promised that when we seek him and when we find him, we will find him. The end of the Gospels, Acts 1 verse 8, which is the sequel to Luke. It says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. God promises if we are willing to send, go out, the Holy Spirit will come on us. In Matthew 28, verse 18, it says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. If we go out, he'll be with us. He plays by his own rules. Seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Will you pray with me? Lord, we confess it's our temptation to be safe with you. It's our temptation to never step out in faith or to trust what we know. But we pray that you'll open our eyes to see you in our world. That you'll instill in us a trust to know that if we step out in faith, you will find us there. And we will meet you. And we will see salvation and hope and joy and peace. Not just in our church, but in this city, in this country, and in this world. We pray and ask this, knowing that you are our strength, you are our courage, and you are our joy. In your name we pray. Amen.